This video was brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Poor Vex, he lost his grandpa. Let's talk about Surfshark for a moment. Now the internet could be a scary place out there. Surveillance web limitation and data mining are happening all the time under your nose. Makes you want to grab some claws and get angry too. But with Surfshark VPN, you do have an easy one for all solutions. So, you know, uh, chill dude. Windows, Android, or Apple products, it doesn't matter what you use. With the click of a button, Surfshark turns you into an anonymous and hard to track user, giving you more freedom on the internet, keeps you away from prying eyes, and prevents companies from doing things like geo-blocking where video and streaming services limit your library simply because of where you live. But with Surfshark, that's all a non-issue. You start up their service, choose the location, you refresh the page, and there you go, your favorite show that you couldn't watch before, all ready for a night of steaming hot vex. And those that use the link in the description below and enter the special code Johnny will not only get 83% off their initial order, but the next three months are also completely free. And as always, I want to thank Surfshark VPN for the sponsor. Let's continue on with the show. Vex. I tell you, if you're looking for a box art that is the perfect summation of the early 2000s vibe, Look no further than this game. I haven't even started yet, and Vex is already very angry at me. Acclaimed, though, around this time, not known for making the best business decisions. They were a far cry from their successful days in the 90s. I think Vex was released about a year before the company would declare bankruptcy, right? I wonder if anyone actually named their kid Torok. Well, I have no idea what this is, but Roxy, if you happen to be watching, I appreciate your love and support. And uh, I just want to say I'm sorry for taking a bit to get to this one. I've had this one in my back shelf for a while now. The little uh, thank you note that you left me uh, mentions one day catching up in a Skype conversation. Uh, I'm sorry. All right, already getting a little worried here. We start the game off. We got the intro playing, but the sound mixing. It's horrendous. I can't hear what the narrator is saying, and there are no subtitles. His grandson, Vex, he finds without money. Vargas and Vex could not stand against Yabu's dark power and were bound in chains with the others. So after watching it again on YouTube with headphones on, there's this planet named Astara. People lived regular lives until the Shadow Wraiths attack, enslaving the inhabitants to do the bidding of Dark Yabu. Among the slaves is Vex, who loses his grandfather to Dark Yabu after showing signs of rebellion. So uh, yeah, that sucks. And after managing to escape his prison, he sneaks aboard Yabu's windship for revenge, but instead of revenge, he finds fortune that he can use for revenge. Ancient war talons that Dark Yabu sealed away some time ago since Yabu couldn't outright destroy them. The talons, being sentient weapons, though they don't talk much after this, wish to help Vex enact vengeance and bound themselves to the angry munchkin to tap into their power. Vex awakens and is immediately greeted by this old dude named Darby who points Vex in the general direction of where he should be going. If Vex wants to stop Yabu, he needs to collect Wraith Hearts, so Vex sets out to do just that. And the story just fucking vanishes after that. There are only two other cutscenes after this point. The halfway mark where Darby is revealed to be Dark Yabu in disguise, which I totally fucking call for the record. As soon as Darby said this shit in the beginning. Be careful. Shadow Wraiths are shape changers. Trust no one along your journey. I said out loud to myself, oh, does that include you? And I was right. So, okay, we got the Dark Yabu reveal courtesy of this girl who is suddenly a thing. Her name is Rhea. She was the narrator of the opening and is just now making an appearance and... <laughs> what is it, cold? Her nipples are just poking out of her fucking suit. But as quick as she was to enter the scene, she is just as quickly out of it. Like after Yabu reveals himself and fucks off, she just vanishes and you don't see her again until the end. The only other time the game has a cutscene. What, no team up with Vex? No elaboration on Dark Yabu? No other context for the worlds we explore? Who are you, Rhea? Why aren't you in this game more? You can collect these journal entries across the game to give some more insight to her, and okay, but she's such a non-entity in this game that we might as well be getting random tidbits from characters who frankly don't matter, but they needed to matter more. I'm getting the feeling we have another Crash Twin Sanity issue here. There's, uh, there's something about this that feels very unfinished. I mean, this game reeks of that all over the place, not exclusively on the story either. There are elements of every world we visit that feel strangely empty gameplay-wise. You check this chamber early in the game, you see these murals showing possible power-ups, you can get this rock suit, and then there's this wing suit you can get later on, but these are not only super situational, like I'm talking more situational than the special caps in Mario 64, you only use them a handful of times, and I mean that, about three, maybe four times in this eight to ten hour adventure? 
that's it. But those other suits you see in those murals, completely unused. They're just there to show what could have been. And man, I am glad I didn't experience Vex when it first came out because if there's one thing that drives me nuts is unused gameplay mechanics that are still carelessly teased in the game despite never being a thing. That's how bullshit urban legends start. And knowing me in my younger days, if I was playing Vex when it first came out, I know I'd be spending all goddamn day looking around to see if they were still in the game or some form or fashion. <laughs> Should have seen how much time I wasted on Pokemon Urban Legends itself. I was dumb. I did learn of this game's tie-in comic, so I was hoping that shed some light on things. Uh, it doesn't really. It just goes into a couple of things these journal entries in the game already tell you. The game's opening at that. It's also only uh, eight pages long. Vex is a complete enough game, I should stress. There is a definitive beginning, middle, and end. And there is still plenty to do for what it is, but man, it is like so obviously undercooked. However, I feel this does service the uh, atmosphere of the adventure. The story already sets a grim mood, right? You can cut your fingertips in the box art with this amount of 2000s edge. The sumo guy you can fight in the game's first world even flips you off when you knock him off the ring the first time. What a dick! But the game's unfinished nature, the lack of inhabitants, the lack of clarity on the world around you, I feel, does benefit the game's ambience. It's unsettling. Borderline Dark Souls, I would even say. Vex is the Dark Souls of art. I'm gonna shut up now. You can find these tombstones on occasion that I suppose are regular inhabitants, but occasionally their spirits will pop up and say something to you, but it's hard to make out given the sound mixing and the filter they have in their voice, but that's still pretty cool. And though there are plenty of different environments, things you will no doubt be familiar with in a platformer, the background is often accompanied by the chaotic remains of the planet. I love the scattered rocks and meteorites you see in the spatial background. It's visually striking and something I can legitimately compliment Vex for. It's cool. But what about the game itself? I'm gonna say now, I was laughing for a bit. With this kind of dour setting that opens with a genocidal aftermath, enslaved inhabitants, your grandpa being murdered and you swearing vengeance is a fucking Mario 64 clone. Bonus points for legitimately surprising me there, Vex. Instead of power stars though, it's these living, beating wraith hearts. That's metal as shit. This ain't your grandpa's Mario clone. You know, if your grandfather was only about six years older than you, that's fucking weird. The game... <laughs> The game is also not going to directly tell you where the hearts are either. The hints are all told in riddles. And if you got a knack for dissecting woody limericks, then you should have fun here. A part of me even liked the one where you had to look inside the game's manual to solve the puzzle. You know, I just hope you didn't buy the game used or secondhand. Just read a guide and save yourself the trouble. So there are around nine worlds to explore where you can play different objectives to earn a wraith heart. But you can also get a wraith heart by collecting these little shards, the, the coins of this game. Or you can collect enough of these soul jars, what basically amounts to this game's red coins. Uh, at least I think you can collect the heart with soul jars. Hello? What's happening here? Do I get the heart or not? Oh, there it is. Why did that take so long? It's Mario 64 with a day and night system to boot. Time naturally passes over the course of the game, but the only differences I notice is that one, enemies are stronger at night, so under no circumstances should you ever be playing stages at night unless you want to spend nearly 20 minutes getting your dick kicked in by an incredibly tight timed mission that I made unnecessarily harder on myself because I didn't realize it was nighttime when I started this. No, I am not better. There are also these bonus stages where you gotta spin on this sundial for a bit until you reach the time of the day where the portal then opens up and you head inside. I want to give another compliment real quick. I love the effect of jumping into other portals no matter if it's in the hub world or in the portals inside different levels. Yeah, there's an obvious loading jump cut, but I don't think you saw stuff like this often around this time, so I want to say this is pretty ambitious. Just, you know, shame about the bankruptcy. <laughs> this game also has dedicated combat, but it's nothing terribly exciting. You have basic punches, an uppercut, a jump kick, and a ground pound. It's more like a ground fireball. These never get upgraded, though, so you're going to be doing a lot of the same shit with the game's already drastically limited selection of shadow wraiths. That's what they call the enemies in this game. You also have this meter that fills up the more combos you do on an enemy. You max it out, you hit a button, and for a short time, you can shoot these fireballs that will likely whiff because the game has no dedicated lock on. No, what I found more useful is the temporary speed up you also get when you use it. Uh, what is this called anyway? Does it even have a name? I'm calling it vexing. Anyway, I don't think the game puts enough emphasis on this. Despite the obvious glowing meter in the top right, I forgot this mechanic was even a thing because of how underutilized it ended up being. I think from what I can remember and from my experience, it was only required to get one shadow heart. And you can only use it when it's fully charged, so you can't even take advantage of a short burst on a whim. No, it's got to be filled to max to even use it. To reach the end of the game, you need at least 60 Wraith Hearts, but the game has over 81. So like Mario 64, you have a bit of freedom on what Wraith Hearts you want to collect. If there's one mission that's given you too much shit, and you will discover these in little to no time at all. I mean, one of the hearts in the first world is a primo example of the term difficulty spike. If you can't do something like that, you can just do something more within your comfort level to make up for it. But you can only do that so many times, so you will have to bite the bullet on some of these missions and tread through 
that bullshit anyway. Vex, I swear, leaves me vexed at times because in one instance, I'm experiencing an honest to God, enjoyable collectathon. Like I am legitimately enjoying myself. The game has great aesthetic. I enjoyed some of the musical tracks and the platforming while basic a couple of times. It functions and even allows me to bend the rules a bit so I can get a couple of those trinkets through my knowledge of gameplay mechanics. I can do stuff like chain together maneuvers to bypass the last wall in this stage and get the heart early. I can ignore the wingsuit in this world and long jump my way to the heart instead, though that did take several attempts. Uh, can we get a count on that, Lewis? Yeah, world record. And there are ideas here that I love seeing in action. The sequence of turning on a console and TV in the manor stage and playing a game of Breakout to get the heart. It's a little jank, but that was a memorable experience. Entering these murals in the Neverglades and collecting soul jars by jumping on the proper pieces. I genuinely enjoyed that. As well as entering different sides of this labyrinth cube in the summit of the sages to collect soul jars, completely turning one platforming stage into another just by changing the angle a bit. Really, these were cool. But too often does Vex do something antiquated or cumbersome to sour my whole experience. Let's start with this. You can't change the camera control. This is more just a me thing and I did eventually adjust, but I don't like it when I tilt the stick to the right and the screen goes the opposite direction. God, please just give me an option. Uh, the game also auto saves. I mean, that is great, but there are no checkpoints in these worlds and some of them are gargantuan. So what this means is that if you fuck up and say one of the game's many long and arduous platforming challenges where you climb up and up and up and up with no end in sight and I cannot fucking stress enough how much the game loves doing these. If you fuck up at the tail end or if you die or some other shit, you gotta do the whole thing over again. Lose all your lives and knock back to the title screen to boot, where you can then try again after sitting through a couple of loading screens. This is made worse with the game's inconsistent access to camera control. Sometimes you can control it, sometimes you can't, no reason given, and they give you some of the worst fucking angles you can ask for in some of these obstacles. And other times the camera will just automatically snap to a different view, making me lose my composure, my footing. <laughs> this is the kind of shit I don't miss from this era. Holy shit. Almost every world in this game has some flavor of this bullshit. Timberdale has that surprise sudden difficulty spike with the spire and that water tower with a bunch of segmented load screens that just breaks up the pace altogether. Dragon Reach wasn't too bad, but the wingsuit is not what I would call an ideal flying power up and this is where you unlock it for the one heart you use it for. The Neverglades is also not that bad, and it's here where I got to really appreciate like how the game uses the controller's vibration to simulate a pulsing heart when you're near a wraith heart. And in this world's platforming sections, I loved how intense it made me get. Tempest Peak Manor is where the bad camera angle started to rear the ugly heads and it only gets worse from here. This fucking anti-gravity challenge in the below. You're upside down, but your controls aren't reversed, so, oh my god, just do yourself a favor and hang upside down for this. You will look like a total asshole, but you'll thank me later. The swimming controls of this game are also not the best. Your default paddling speed is so slow, so most times you'll find yourself heading underwater and using the boosted swim, since it's faster, but it sure as shit ain't precise. You also can't jump on the surface of the water without heading in the diving mode every time you land back down, and that just makes travel feel clunky. Dagger Crag, fuck this place. This is where I ran into the most shit. The poorly timed shrinking platforms that you gotta go front and back with, deaths via camera fuckery, jank collision detection with ledge grabs, shit boxes, son, I mean that in two ways. You gotta destroy some of these blocks to climb this area to reach the heart, but check this shit. Look, why did that block break all the way over there? I was nowhere close to that bitch. This mummy boss belonged in a different game, one where Vex is better equipped for the encounter. It feels random on when he becomes open to attack, and when you do start laying on the damage, he starts getting so obnoxiously fast in that ball form and he could turn on a dime too, he's virtually impossible to avoid. And whenever you get hit, his cycle resets. Fuck out of here with that bullshit. Games should naturally get more difficult as you progress, but Vex at times, I swear man, slams on the gas at completely random junctions. It's after Dagger Crag where I started to get pretty tired of this game. There were still glimmers of great design design here and there in future worlds, but Vex at this point was leaning too much into the unnecessarily long and winded obstacle courses that were so punishing for even the most basic screw up. The overuse of the vertical spires, the platforms are getting smaller and smaller with little to no breathing room. I mean, check out this sort of shit the Frostblight Mill wanted you to do. This just keeps going, it's do or die from beginning to end. The Citadel Shadow has all this too, and I mean, I was expecting that as the final world of the game and all that, but the platforms, look at them, they're so narrow, I might as well be jumping on breadsticks. That road Rotate. With the lack of checkpoints I mentioned, altogether Vex is one of the more grueling collectathons I've played, but not entirely for well-designed reasons I find. I couldn't even beat the final boss. I got to the second phase, but I stopped giving a shit when I realized I gotta do all this in one life. And this dude's rocking like three frame attacks that are so fucking hard to respond to. Nah man, I got other games to look at. I am moving on. I played 98% of the game already. That's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I gotta look for my mental stability at this point. So donations are often about me getting out of my comfort zone, well-intentioned or otherwise. And I wanna stress again, uh, Roxy, if you haven't been watching, I do appreciate your love and support. This wasn't a complete dumpster fire. There were things I did legitimately like about Vex, but it is definitely a relic of its time. 
any victim of circumstance. Again, I have to ask, why did they give the only female in the game rock hard nipples for such a nothing character? I like nipples, but I also want to care about who the nipples are attached to. It's a shame, too, because, you know, outside of the nipples, Raya has a cool design. It's such a waste. All right, well, back to the box I go. Let's see here. Singularity? Looks grim. Also looks very Xbox 360, but uh, we'll find out next time. As always, thank you all for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care.